Hello, jean -Dier. Hello, Kevin. One of the problems people have when they're learning conscious guidance and control is to how to know whether you're making progress. So how can we judge objectively that we're making progress uh, if what we're to do is to not just go by our feeling or our just a uh, sensation or a feeling of, of what is correct? How do we judge uh, in an objective way uh, when we're making progress and when we're not? Well, you... Well, this question has been uh, has been part of the Alexander Technique and the modern Alexander Technique for a very long time now. Uh, and at first, it was not asking the way you're you're presenting it, because uh, uh, for your question in the modern Alexander Technique, you remember I was trained. Oh, you were trained as an Alexander modern Alexander Technique teacher also. Uh, there was a a quick answer to your question. And the quick answer was, uh, well, you just uh, find a, well, uh, expert touch teacher, an expert manipulator, as Alexander called them, and uh, he will tell you uh, if you're making progress. So your only way to know if you're making progress is to, well, have somebody that is an expert somatic teacher to feel whether you are or not making progress. And so we imagine that that person is this somatic teacher has been trained, his sensor appreciation has been re-educated. So it's not that he's walking on water, uh, like uh, some, some Christ things or no, but nearly. That is, uh, he's, he's got to a, a different plane and he can from his own position uh, tell you where you are. Uh, so, uh, there was then uh, another question, which is exactly the same as the one you ask, but not directed at the pupil, but directed at the teacher. How do we know uh, whether a teacher that is an expert manipulator is really able to, well, well uh, assess by feeling something that should be well, uh, as Alexander said, only assessed by conscious control. Well, uh, it was the question that we call the question of assessment standards. So for example, uh, uh, there are schools everywhere in the world or training centers, as you, we call them, that are training people to become modern Alexander teachers. And um, how do you assess uh, how these, these people are performing when they finish their training. You, you could imagine uh, using the same exact same assessment to assess their own teacher. The senior teacher should be assessed, yes? But they're not, they're not. Uh, there was never any uh, formal uh, qualitative assessment of the school. And um, this has been brought to me very recently by a conversation that was going on on the uh, conversation. Well, uh, you could call it that, yes. It was a bit more vehement. It was one teacher that, uh, a, senior, a senior teacher that uh, in fact started to uh, vindicate that uh, another uh, society of teachers different from his was not a, a proper, uh, Alexander Technique uh, training system. Um, and uh, he, he was saying that there was no assessment in this uh, uh, society to assess the quality of the teachers. There was a, a, an answer to him by another uh, modern Alexander teacher. Uh, he's called uh, Fitzgerald. Yeah, I think he's an American teacher from Amstad. And uh, his answer is pretty interesting. So let's have, let's have a look at it first and see what he says. So there are no agreed upon assessment standards for teacher training established by Alexander and maintained by STAT affiliates. STAT means a Society of Teachers of the Alexander Technique. The first STAT teaching, uh, STAT society was uh, created after Alexander, FM Alexander's death because Alexander always refused to caution such a society. 
And so Mr. Fitzgerald is also saying that Alexander never wrote down what he expected of his trainees. So we only have the writing of the now deceased first generation teacher to, to guide us. The affiliated society as a group has cancelled quantitative protocols governing attendance time, teacher training ratio, etc., but not qualitative assessment standards. And um, most of it is, uh, is true, I believe it's true. Uh, Alexander never wrote any uh, formal paper explaining how to assess uh, teachers of the Alexander Technique. Uh, maybe because that would have meant that people would have had a, a way to assess his own capacity as a teacher. You never know. Well, uh, the question is very, very interesting. And so, uh, even more than the question is the answer that everyone is going to provide. So, of course, in the initial Alexander Technique, we have a, we have a, a strong answer to this question because uh, it's very important. Uh, because otherwise, uh, let me tell you what may happen, what could happen, or what uh, may have had happened in the past is that, uh, well, the only way uh, a teacher is assessed at the end of his training is through no qualitative assessment, either from somatic, which is the teachers that are the head of training are going to say, well, personally, they consider that this person is apt to be a teacher of the modern Alexander Technique. And that means that they have felt with their hands. So it's a subconscious control that is uh, telling you whether your pupil is, can, can teach conscious guidance and control, which is rather surprising. Yes? Uh, you you have to, in fact, trust that person. And as there are different uh, training courses, different societies, of course, uh, it's quite easy to distrust the judgment, the personal judgment, or the personal feeling judgment of a person. And so I remember when I was myself training in the 90s, I would go to other training courses. And uh, quite often, I heard very, very strong comments about my own teacher training course by other head of training courses that were saying, well, uh, how could you choose that training course? You're not, you're not learning the true Alexander Technique. So we are now um, hearing, so this uh, gentleman that started the discussion was saying that uh, uh, the true Alexander Technique is only taught with the hands. And uh, I say the true Alexander Technique he's talking about is only assessed with the hands, with a somatic approach where the person is going to feel whether the coordination is correct or not. And this, uh, to me, is an, unacceptable. You're going to tell a pupil that a student in a training course, well, I think you should do a fourth year because uh, I judge that you are not ready. How do you judge? What is the basis of that judgment? I feel you're not ready. Uh, this is, uh, well, obviously very, very problematic, yes? Uh, if we are really teaching conscious guidance and control, how can this be? So this is one question, it's open, but my answer is, uh, well, uh, it cannot. So we need to have another way to create a uh, qualitative assessment of anybody, either of the pupil, of the student that wants to become a teacher, or the teacher himself. And so we, we do judge, and uh, we judge by... Uh, visual observation, as you will see. So um, Alexander has opened the way for that because um, he's, uh, he's established not a, a formal paper explaining what uh, the, the student of the modern Alexander technique should be able to uh, perform after the training, but he's, wrote, he's written four books. So if you look into the books, well, you will find some uh, evidence 
of uh, certain uh, standards that are necessary. And there is one that is coming back all the time. So we have already seen that uh, sentence, I believe, but I think it's, it's worth having a look again. Here it is. When the instructions given are carefully followed, the effect upon the whole mechanical mechanism of the person concerned is shown by the fact that when the coordinating principles brought about by this method are established, there is a constant tendency for the torso to lengthen, whereas the usual tendency due to faulty standing position and the incorrect coordination which follows is for the torso to shorten. And uh, just uh, next to that uh, text, I have added the photo of a man that Alexander uh, really uh, appreciated. Uh, well, not for his uh, uh, behavior outside or in the pitch, but for uh, the coordination of the movements of the different parts of the torso. It's Don Bradman. It's quite easy to find on the internet. He's an Australian uh, batsman. And um, well, yes, this man uh, showed a, a, a real consistency in the relationship between the different parts of the torso so that uh, we can see that there is a constant tendency for the torso to lengthen. That's what Alexander liked in this person. So now we are, uh, in fact, facing a new problem, as I explained in our last uh, talk. It's the problem of uh, define, defining what is, uh, for Alexander, the torso to lengthen. So the first image is the image of, of Don Bradman. Alexander never gave a lesson to Don Bradman, but uh, he's uh, repeatedly uh, said to his uh, family and friends that uh, every time Don Bradman had a game, he would go and watch him for his capacity to lengthen the torso in activity. So, uh, well, this is uh, an idea. The second idea is to then, uh, well, follow Alexander in his own work. And so the second idea is to watch uh, what could make different characteristics of the coordination of the different movements of the parts of the torso, which, which lead to that idea of uh, having a constant tendency for the torso to lengthen. Well, it's, uh, it's quite possible, in fact, to uh, establish, you know, uh, exact measurement that will tell you whether uh, you, as a pupil or as a teacher, are performing some activity with a torso that has a tendency to lengthen and widen. And so here we see Alexander working with a young Irish man in 1951. And so what we see is that uh, Alexander is maintaining a very strong curve at the upper back. Uh, this is uh, completely different from what you would get if you were lying down on the table, for example. Uh, one friend of Alexander said, uh, uh, if you were lying on the table, you should have to levitate the upper torso. Is uh, like uh, maintaining with his right hand, is maintaining the curve. So we can see that the top of the thoracic spine is very far forward of the middle thoracic spine. Yes. And uh, this brings the head to be, well, forward of the frontal parts of the torso, of all the three frontal parts of the torso. We are lucky because in the same film, we see Alexander inclining the, as he said, the body, which uh, for him means the torso and shoulders and head of the pupil backward on the chair. It was something he was performing all the time. In the previous uh, film that was uh, in fact made one year before with uh, what we would say today, uh, a very advanced student, nearly a teacher, he used exactly the same procedure of leaning backward. And again, we see the same, well, coordination of movements. 
so that the upper torso is sent very far forward. And uh, another comment is that the lower back is back. As a result, uh, there are no parts that are protruding forward of the head. So we have an idea of the definition. You, you could say that uh, head forward and up corresponds to uh, that particular organization of the spine, of the thoracic and lumbar spine. Yes, if the thoracic spine is uh, projected forward and up, you can say that the neck is going to follow forward and up, and that the, is the only way to get your head forward and up. So we have here a condition that Alexander would call lengthening the torso. And so he is promoting this activity for his pupil, apparently. But when we look at other pictures, we see that he is himself organizing the different parts of his torso in the same manner. So that means that he possesses the capacity to readjust the part of his own torso. We know that uh, he considered that this capacity to readjust one's own parts was essential to teach the Alexander Technique to, some, to anyone. So uh, I thought that this is a, a very a good assessment and I started to compare uh, different uh, societies, different teachers, and see who were close to uh, the, well, guidelines that Alexander is proposing in his books. And uh, when I say proposing in his books, uh, there is not one uh, element. But uh, for example, if you look at this one, when he says that uh, it's the examination of the subject which reveal the hollowing of the back with the accompanying protrusion of the abdominal wall, whilst the abdominal muscle will be deficient in the energy and tone necessary to the maintenance of efficiency in the digestive organs. Uh, he's, he's clearly pointing to defects. He's saying that uh, hollowing of the back and ac accompanying protrusion of the lower uh, chest, uh, abdominal part content, is clearly not what is, uh, in fact, obtained by the conscious readjustments of the movements of the parts. So he said that uh, uh, in dealing with this case, Many parts of the organism will, re will require readjustment. And uh, this is where uh, I depart from my colleagues of the modern Alexander Technique, because what they understand by this sentence is that uh, uh, many parts of the organism of the student will require readjustment by the hands of the modern Alexander Technique teacher. Yes? Uh, the teachers are saying that it's only through the hands that uh, the pupil can, uh, in fact, uh, reacquire uh, uh, the means whereby readjusting the parts of his own body. So he has to be readjusted by the touch teacher. So the touch teacher has to be present in the same room. And uh, this, the, the touch teacher has to organize the movements for the pupil. And the pupil will feel what this readjustment is and know uh, how to, in fact, uh, perform the readjustment himself. That is the theory. And it's only a theory. Uh, I discovered that very early in my training course. So uh, when you assess, uh, for example, look, uh, here is uh, a teacher of the modern Alexander Technique that is uh, communicating with his hands the correct uh, functioning of the torso, the correct coordination of the movements of the parts. But there is something uncanny. If you compare uh, Alexander in the same, uh, approximately the same gesture, uh, well, the same well, system is seen to be applied, which we see that uh, for the front of the torso to be that parallel to the back line 
it's absolutely obvious because the, the, the upper ribs are shorter than the middle ribs. It's absolutely obvious that uh, it's necessary to have a movement of the upper torso forward and upward relative to the middle torso. Well, when we look at the modern Alexander teacher, we see something that is really uh, a signal. We see that the sternum bone, which is connected both with the upper ribs and the middle ribs, we see that the sternum bone is frankly inclined backward at the top. And uh, the pupil, in fact, is directed exactly in the same way. Well, it's impossible to have the sternum incline that far back in space relatively to the middle torso uh, to not hollow the back and protrude, protrude the abdomen. Alexander's back is full, yes, and his abdomen is back because of the relationship between the upper and middle torso movements. And this is certainly not happening in the uh, system of training through the somatic guidance. Apparently, the teacher has been trained in this way, he's been feeling this organization, and he's been told that this organization is the correct one. And so he's reproducing exactly. Well, as he's been taught, exactly what is felt with his teacher is reproduced with his own pupils. Does it make that conscious guidance? Not at all. Yes. So how to create an assessment that can be conscious? Well, you have to create control conditions. So I am teaching without touching my pupils. I'm I've been teaching uh, without hands for more than 10 years. And uh, I have developed a series of systems where you can uh, control. Uh, assessment is like control. Qualitative assessment is qualitative control. So what it is I call qualitative control. How can I teach my pupil to assess themselves or to assess anybody else by the same manner? Uh, it's quite simple. We just measure. So the question is uh, how to create a, a qualitative assessment not only assess how many hours the, the student has been trained, how many teachers have, he, he has trained with, how many hours of real one-to-one -one work, because uh, I only teach on one-to-one, -one, but in many schools, there are hours that are devoted to other things like uh, reading books, like uh, uh, learning some anatomy, and uh, all this time is not spent uh, really using oneself. Uh, uh, with uh, conscious guidance and control. Uh, very often you will see in this school when it's time for, uh, for example, the anatomy session or for the discussion session, you will see people uh, sitting in very, very strange way that have nothing like uh, an, any, there is no organization of the movement of the part of the torso that are, uh, no organization that is conscious. It's all subconscious. So, uh, I understand this idea of, uh, of quantitative assessment, but for me, it doesn't mean anything. It's only qualitative assessment that can have a, a, a value in this form of uh, work. So uh, what is a qualitative assessment? Because the, uh, saying that there is no qualitative assessment is not making uh, any progress in the conversation because we don't know what a qualitative assessment could be. For example, in mathematics, uh, qualitative assessment is easy. You just uh, verify that the pupil can on his own, well, solve a mathematical problem. If he can, well, he has the capacity and you can give him the, uh, well, uh, formula selling that, that's it. You can, you can teach that, that uh, level of mathematics. Um, in the Alexander Technique, it depends on what you're talking about, because very often uh, what is assessed is whether the pupil, the student in the, the training school, can uh, impart with his hands a new uh, organization of the different parts. It's not exactly the purpose of the Alexander Technique. The purpose of the Alexander Technique is, the Alexander Technique is not uh, touching people 
to reorganize their movements. It's not any, it's, it's not at all a, a system of cure where you do reorganize the pupils around you. Well, it's supposed to be a teaching method where you teach people how to readjust themselves. That's the difference between cure and uh, uh, an approach to the self and learning. Yes, uh, well, reorganize, reorganizing your own movements, your own coordination. That's, that's how I understand this, this work. So uh, our teacher, how good is a teacher to readjust people has very little interest. What is of interest is whether when the, the senior teacher, for example, is readjusting somebody, or doing any sort of activity is, is to assess whether the mechanism of the torso is seen as lengthening or not. So to come back to, to the image uh, I am showing, uh, you will see that, uh, for example, we have a, a pupil here of mine uh, that is having a long distance session in a room, you know, thousands of kilometers away. But there are things that you can uh, establish from the start as true. Uh, the person has created an experiment where the front of the ankle is set as the same distance from a wall that the lower part of the sternum. This is exactly what she's doing right at that exact moment during the film. Yes, because all this is film. And uh, we see then that um, there is a geometrical construction where the torso is set exactly vertical to, to the front of the instep. This is uh, just a, a conclusion uh, from reasoning because uh, as the wall is a uh, vertical of reference, any spot that is at the same distance as another, it can be said to be uh, set on the same vertical because the wall is vertical to start with. So now that this is established, well, the assessment can be even uh, performed with uh, more indications. For example, it is seen here that the back is really going back. We have a person that is lengthening the lower back and uh, you will find that the shape of the back is, uh, well, the same as the one showed by Alexander in his photos or his films. We see here the hump, the, the very great uh, thoracic curve that is preserved and not flattened by pulling the upper torso backward like it is seen. So without looking at the sternum as a whole, you can be certain of something. If you see the back being back like this and the hump above it, so that the first ribs are very far forward of the middle ribs, ribs that are under the armpit, you can be sure that this person is wearing a vertical sternum. And you can be sure of something else is that the vertical sternum is at the same distance of the wall than every single part of the front of the torso, meaning that the movements the person has made with the different parts of the torso have established this proportion such that the front head is forward of the abdomen. There is no protruding abdomen. The abdomen is not protruding relatively to the head, either in the vertical position, or I have other images of uh, different students, the same lady and a, a young gentleman, and you can see that they are playing at the same game. Well, it's a game with, uh, with rulers to establish the uh, accurate positioning in space of different parts and so that their movement can be assessed. We want to know if, uh, for example, the movements of the lower and middle torso are, um, well, proportionate in speed, because it's only with, um, with having these movement backward proportionate in speed that you can, be, you can get that back to lengthen and widen. Otherwise, you wouldn't get this, uh, so these people are assessed and we find that by their own means, 
they are readjusting the different parts of the torso in exactly the same way as Alexander was re readjusting his pupil in order to give his pupil the capacity to do this for himself. The, the, the idea of Alexander was not to manipulate all his pupils until they were correct. It was for their pupils to, in fact, understand the movements and the principles of coordination of these movements. And so uh, I can assess, and my pupils too, which are going to watch their own film, because you must understand something is when these pupils are doing these sorts of performance, they are doing these sorts of performance very quickly, in two seconds. It's, uh, it's the way I teach. I want people to be able to readjust quickly. If you start to readjust uh, during a length of time, you're going to feel many, many things. And when you feel, it's very, very difficult to stick to decisions, to stick to, to very solid intentions. I am going to pull the iliac away from the side of the knee and back in space at the same time I, as I pull the lower ribs backward. Well, if you start to feel, there is every chance that you're going to, to well, interfere, try to do more one of the other, the, the one that is missing, you're going to try to add something, and this is the exact catastrophe that we want to prevent. So, these people are able to perform this type of organization of the parts, very similar to the one Alexander was performing, very quickly, but they don't feel that they are, they are doing so. They don't feel that they are lengthening the back. They don't feel that they are, uh, well, projecting the upper torso forward and up, and as a result, the neck and head forward and up. They don't feel that. They, this is, these movements are so different from their habits of coordination of the movements of the parts that they feel all wrong. The point is not to make them experience this coordination, meaning experience the result, because the feeling you have is the result of the movements. No, we don't want to, to train the results of the movement. This is no way to train the cause. The cause of the movement is the decisions, and decisions that are made quickly, no matter what one feels. As long as the pupil tries to feel right, tries to feel what it could be to lengthen the back, what it could be to, to have the upper torso come forward and up, the pupil cannot present these, uh, these shapes. The, the somatic training does not work at all. Yes, it's a, it's a strange thing, but here uh, we have a constructive, conscious control. We, we can, uh, when I say we, the pupil and myself, can observe the video they have produced and uh, discuss whether the result of their conscious guidance can be effectively controlled and measured as the result of the orders. It's, uh, it's as simple as that. So, well, it's quite a harsh way of uh, learning, is that uh, you learn something and it's either right or wrong. There are nowadays many people that think that uh, teaching or learning should be fun, learning should be easy and light, and uh, above all, uh, learning should be uh, made with uh, your uh, sense of self always protected. Well, I can tell you something is that in this kind of teaching, there is no protection. It's either right or wrong. You, you will see on screen whether uh, the back is going back, whether the upper torso is coming forward and up, whether the torso is seen uh, with a tendency to lengthen or not. Well, if it's not, then this is where the technique has to be applied. The technique is a technique for solution. So it's not a technique for uh, being emotionally protected, thinking, oh dear, I am part of a unique group of uh, blessed people. 
that have been touched. No, it's a, there is a mechanical, a psychomechanical problem to be solved. How do we solve a psychomechanical problem? So I help the pupil to consider the psychomechanical problem with me, meaning the first thing is to, in fact, prevent the, uh, the emotional reaction of the person. The person is going to discover, oh dear, I am not lengthening and widening as I thought I was. My sensory appreciation has not been reeducated. I'm talking about uh, many teachers of the modern Alexander technique that have lessened with me. It's even more difficult for them than for beginners. Because for beginners, well, uh, well, they want to have lessened and they are wrong. Well, that's absolutely logical. You know, otherwise, why would they need lessons if they were already correct and right? So they expect to be wrong. So there is no problem. The problem starts with people that uh, uh, have always been told that they were fine. They, you're fine as you are. You, you're already perfect. Well, if you're already perfect, uh, it's quite a difficult uh, moment to, in fact, consider that, wow, uh, on screen, you're absolutely not capable of using simple instructions. It's it's our fate. We were never trained to use instruction, really. Uh, the modern Alexander teacher, they thought, well, the first, the, the first generation teacher, they thought that by repeating the somatic transmission, by repeating the, uh, this behavioral uh, training, where the person would repeat the correct gesture as uh, they were uh, creating, with their hands, the person will uh, progressively integrate this coordination into habitual use. Well, I've got many, many pictures of modern Alexander teachers uh, performing actions and really shortening, shortening the torso. It, uh, they are everywhere to see on the, on the internet. Every teacher that wants to, in fact, uh, uh, sell his, uh, his technique is going to, to show images. So let's have a look at a few, just a few so, so that you, you see what I'm talking about. So uh, everywhere in the world, you will see kinds of pictures of uh, this style. So you see a senior teacher that is uh, practicing. So we see that he's uh, gently manipulating the pupil. Well, I'm not looking at how he's manipulating the pupil. I'm looking at the protruding abdomen. I'm looking at the hollowed back. I'm looking at the upper torso really pulled backward. Uh, this is uh, not what Alexander expected. This is for me clearly not the kind of readjustment that should be performed by anybody, especially somebody that is uh, touching someone else and communicating the essence of his coordination. What, what sort of essence of coordination is there? Well, uh, it's certainly not, as uh, uh, a teacher said, the Alexander Technic model. Yes, I see on the on the right another teacher somewhere else, a completely different society, and uh, uh, curio curiously, uh, neither stat nor other society are performing any better in that sense. There is no well conscious assessment of what the teacher the teacher readjustment is producing on himself. So uh, you're not, there's, there's no qualitative assessment of the pupil, but there is no assessment uh, uh, as a rule. Uh, if if the, the same assessment cannot be in fact met by the teacher and the pupil, there is no assessment whatsoever that has any value. So this is uh, uh, to, to be seen everywhere. When you, when you observe these images, there are, I have traced lines. So there are lines to trace, of course, uh, the movement of the middle torso relatively to the upper and lower torso. And uh, well, I cannot say that this, uh, this is part of a training course, for example. The, I cannot say that uh, this is, uh, uh, well, meets the standard of the lengthening of the torso. Alexander says the constant tendency of lengthening of the torso is the result of the, the, this system of conscious 
readjustment or conscious guidance of the readjustments of the movements. So there are different uh, sort of images where you will see either the torso as I see it, and uh, for me, this is completely different from Alexander's performance. Uh, there is another one. You see a red line in the front. I want to check where is the head relatively to the uh, middle torso, for example. It's a good, it's a good assessment. And uh, we have a, a, a young teacher that is putting hands on a senior teacher. And apparently, the senior teacher doesn't see anything wrong with it. Yes? And uh, the hands are maybe good. They produce a good feeling. Yet, uh, the organization of the movements of the parts is absolutely wrong. So we are dealing with that. And so when there is uh, the hollowed back and the protruding abdomen, you can be sure that the sternum is really pulled back at the top. So once your pupils or once yourself know such a relationship between the spatial positioning of the different parts. Well, it's quite easy when you watch a video to say whether uh, you are improving your capacity to readjust, your capacity to readjust by coordinating the movements of the different parts, or whether you're not. Uh, very often also you have to understand that in certain activities, you may become quite uh, good at organizing the movements. And uh, if something is changed in this activity, then uh, your coordination will flounder, will like disappear, as if it was impossible for you. So very often, I have some, some of my students or pupils that are despairing because they say, I can't understand. I was able to do that last week. And this week, during the lesson, it was all gone. I, I could not perform it. Well, of course, the, the pupil doesn't realize that the new uh, experiment involves many more movement than the previous one. And what was possible in the previous activity is now lost. This is not a problem. This is the beginning of a solution. The, the pupil must understand that uh, uh, there is a need for a capacity for solid, uh, creating solid intentions, a solid series of intentions. No matter what are the conditions, we must be able to reorganize the movements of the parts of the torso. When it's not the case, well, it's the reason for having a conscious technique. The pupil must be able to stop, start thinking about it, start reasoning, start re-watching the images, let go of the disappointment, let go of the, the, the emotional reaction to it and start analyzing. What is different? What are the movements? In what way are the movements different? Uh, what is making the new performance so much more difficult than the previous one? Well, this will lead to many, many discoveries. This will lead to an opening of the capacities to experiment and find new experiments. The, the idea is not to uh, finish and say, in all conditions, I'm lengthening and widening. It's not true. Uh, anybody, uh, Alexander said that uh, uh, you can improve your uh, kinesthesia. So uh, to the point where you're absolutely certain that everything is going to be right if you feel right this is absolutely untrue this i've never seen that to be true uh it, it would mean that there is a stage where the, your technique is useless why would you need a technique to reason out solutions if suddenly this technique has brought you to a stage where well you don't need it no you will still need it it's always possible to find a new activity, a new stimulation, a new, uh, well, limitation that will make you need to use your conscious mind in order to, well, uh, ask questions, present the problem, represent the forces and the movements, and uh, slowly build the capacity to uh, respond to instructions. We are giving ourselves instruction, but uh, you have to understand something. You, you may be given the correct instructions. 
it doesn't mean that you are going to be able straight away to perform the instruction. Of course not. Uh, I, I, I'm, I, I agree with these uh, touch teachers that say that uh, uh, you, cannot, you cannot learn through, um, well, Zoom lessons. If the Zoom lessons are just, uh, uh, you know, uh, like coaching, giving you nice uh, cycles to reproduce that have no sense, no meaning, and no need for reasoning, of course, uh, it's absolutely obvious that you can learn. You have to solve problems. You have to be presented with problem to solve. And uh, in, in the first pr problem you're going to be presented is the problem that when you are in instruction, even if you understand the principle, even if you understand the model on which the, the principle is constructed, well, uh, it does not mean that you are going to be able to perform the activity uh, incorporating different movements. This is to be to be constructed every single time. And so, uh, yes, one-to-one -one lessons on Zoom are possible. You can learn, oh, I would not say the true Alexander technique. I don't want to, uh, <laughs> to inflict that upon uh, some of the older teachers, but uh, uh, you can learn the technique of conscious guidance and control, which is certainly very different from the, well, the true Alexander technique they are teaching. Does it make uh, sense? Have you got any question? Earlier, you mentioned the phrase psychomechanical problems. Can you explain what you mean by and what Alexander means by psychomechanical? Oh, yes. Um, well, the movement of the upper part of the torso forward of the middle torso is uh, seen as possible because Alexander is performing, performing it. It's, uh, it's seen that uh, if you, I, I want to show you a, a picture so that we, we are clear about what I'm talking about. So um, here we see that the upper torso is uh, quite forward of the middle torso. And uh, so you could say uh, mechanically the torso is able to uh, accept this kind of uh, relationship. Well, now, if you if you look to the left and you look at uh, at uh, other people performing the same incl inclination of the torso, you will find that uh, well, either they don't understand the problem, the mechanical problem, but then there is something that is absolutely obvious: is that they are not solving it. the The solution Alexander is presenting uh, is not part of their somatic uh, cognition. They, they are doing something completely different. So it's, it's quite clear that uh, to obtain the shape on the left, it's necessary for the middle torso to be inclined faster forward than the upper torso. As a result, uh, we see a posture, if you want, it, which is the result of this movement. And the posture is such that the upper torso is very far backward and the middle torso is seen protruding with a, well, a distinct result is that the head is further back than the middle torso when Alexander's face is further forward than the middle torso. So what we call, or what Alexander calls psychomechanical problem is the translation in practice of a series of movements that you may understand theoretically. I explain, I show diagrams, I ask a pupil, where should the torso go if we want to obtain this shape? And the person will tell me it has to go forward and up. Okay? So the person understand the model, understand which parts have to move at which speed. Uh, it's, it's necessary to, sh to slow down the middle torso and accelerate the upper torso to obtain the shape Alexander is displaying. Uh, but then we discover it's a psychomechanical problem because when we ask the person to lean forward, to go into lunge, for example, as it was the case here, we discover that uh, the person has no control over these movements. Uh, so we want the person to transform an intention into an action or a decision of speed of a part relatively to another. The person has to represent the problem. The person has to, in fact, no matter how many teaching uh, hands-on lessons that person has received, 
because these teachers or I've seen teachers that have been uh, teaching for many, many years and still uh, the psychomechanical problem is not solved, which means that the person does not represent uh, the, uh, what is necessary to obtain the back to lengthen and widen. I have, I have very, very disturbing images, you know, that I have found. Let, let me show you um, a, a, an image. You, you have a lady uh, speaking, and this lady is speaking in front of a group of Alexander teachers. I'm not going to comment on the, on the situation of the, of the assistants, but look at the, at the teacher. The teacher is talking. This is a first generation teacher. You can see that uh, she's really arching her back. And this is not a, you know, an instant instantaneous image where she's all organizing her torso perfectly and then suddenly for a brief second, she's not. No, she spends 20 minutes arching the back in that way. A first generation teacher. And so you will see uh, there is a red line because I want to indicate that when she's standing in that way, the abdomen is really, really far forward of the head. So there is a psychomechanical problem because the feeling that this person has is that she's standing normally. She's, uh, she's um, well, during that speech, there is nothing really complex. She's just talking some anecdotes about uh, her time in the training course with Alexander. She's, um, she's having fun. Well, she's having fun, but uh, the psychomechanical problem of lengthening the torso is certainly not solved. So this is what I call a psychomechanical problem. And I've got uh, many other uh, examples in video or photos of first generation teachers that uh, apparently are not very concerned about uh, lengthening the torso. The tendency to lengthen the torso has disappeared more or less with Alexander. Uh, all the examples I have uh, show uh, people that are quite happy to display their work on the internet. Uh, I mean, socially, everybody can have these images, can look at them, and uh, they are promoting a fantastic somatic technique that is performing like magic uh, rehabilitation, while uh, they themselves are not shown uh, to, to be able to, well, simply organize the different movements of the parts of the torso by themselves. It's, it's strange. There is such a discrepancy between these senior teachers, or I was talking of the, that person that was in fact uh, vindicating other teachers for not being true teachers, because they were not assessed in the way he had been assessed. And, uh, and the reality where you see that uh, modern Alexander teachers are somatic teachers. They are not conscious guidance teachers and they don't certainly follow the guidelines that are given by Alexander in his books. Ale Alexander ne never gave any guideline uh, for his uh, student uh, that is apart from his four books. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard some teachers say that you can't learn anything with these books anyway. Well, that shows. So yes, a psychomechanical problem is a problem that to be solved need the understanding of the person. Uh, I'm saying this because uh, I've never seen the somatic technique work with these kind of problems, which mean that uh, a somatic teacher that has been trained with somatic hands-on, a touch technique to discover what is the meaning of instruction through feeling, because uh, there is no other way. Um, these people are not very good at solving psychomechanical problems, uh, especially the one that are uh, highlighted in Alexander's books, because uh, in the books, in the four books, they are difficult to read, that's for sure, but uh, they are littered with indication 
of uh, a very, very clear spatial relationship between parts in standing, in leaning, in going forward, in going backward, uh, in walking. Uh, so uh, these are uh, what Alexander called psychological moment. So I think it's interesting for you to have a definition of psychological moment uh, in Alexander idea, because it's very close to this idea of, of, uh, of a psychomechanical problem. What is a psychological moment for Alexander? It's a moment where you're asked to perform an activity Oh, very common leaning forward, uh, I mean, inclining the torso in standing or sitting, uh, going, uh, you're sitting and going to just rising to stand, or you're standing and you just want to incline the torso with the knees against the chair. These are very simple moments. But you're asked to perform these action with very, very precise, controlled situation of different body parts. And then when comes the moment to go, to enter into action, everything you feel is going to tell you, no, this is not possible. Or the only way I could make this possible, what the teacher wants, is to uh, do something which I know I should not do. I, I, will, I will incline the torso, but I'm going to collapse uh, the upper part. And why? Because it's a psychological problem. We have been guided by feeling all our life. We've maybe have uh, uh, been trained in somatic uh, courses where feeling was very central into understanding. And suddenly the psychological moment is you have to follow decisions that are not based on feeling and you can't. So you have to uh, in fact, uh, encounter these, these moments. So I can show these moments to all of my pupils. They will, I will show it to them. And uh, I'm trying to prepare them for the encounter with psychological moments so that they don't despair, they don't uh, have a, an emotional reaction so that they suddenly disappear and don't want to hear any more of conscious guidance because uh, it, it happens to all of us. Yes, we have all this uh, uh, vision of ourselves as uh, either succeeding in all conditions or def defeated in all conditions. Uh, the extremes exist, but the, psych the psychological moment is going to make that uh, real for, for, for the moment. And uh, that, that's when the technique starts to be applied. I cannot, I cannot uh, teach the technique of, uh, of reason uh, solution, reason readjustment. If someone is uh, believes that uh, he, is, he, he, he is guided by a superior somatic cognition that knows what is right, that, uh, you know, I feel in my bone that this is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you have a video, this is, uh, this is finished. So the psychological moment and uh, psychomechanical uh, problems are the same thing, really. And, and you've just demonstrated nicely there earlier that to know whether you're actually solving a psychomechanical problem, you have to use visual observation. You have to or watch a video or look at still images. It's not by feeling. No. And you're looking to see if you have managed to lengthen the torso or not during the movements. Yeah. With uh, more and more precise uh, system for measurements. We, at first you measure quite grossly, but then as you have a greater number of mental objects in mind, uh, it's possible with uh, different rulers, with different systems to uh, make sure that we know exactly where the feet are, where the knees are, and where, for example, the middle torso is, and then assess the movement of the other parts. So uh, you start to have a clear understanding of uh, psychomechanical problems and uh, also their solutions. Because when you know how to, uh, to create a solution, the solution is there. I'm not saying that the solution is going to work every time, but because you've been through that test of fire, that suddenly, wow, nothing is working, 
you and you have uh, overcome the problem by intelligence, then that intelligence is not lost. It's not because you you find a new problem. No, your intelligence is more like uh, stimulated, and you think, wow. How did I solve the last one? <laughs> Let's see if I can use the same systems or if I, if I need to implement other things in order to, to find the solution to the problem that I'm encountering. Uh, the, the, the technique is not the, uh, I mean, when you learn the technique, you are not learning the solution. You are learning how to create uh, theories and experiment this theory to see which one are working, which one are not. But the assessment is absolutely objective. Is it lengthening the torso, as you said, or not? And that you control, not on what you feel, of course, you control on the video you're, you're making when you're performing the adjustment. Okay, thank you very much, Jondo. This was great. Uh, for everybody watching the video, you can get links to Jondo's websites underneath and get information from him where to book a lesson, how to book a lesson with him. And we'll see you in the next video. Thank you very much, Shonda. Well, see you, you're most see welcome. You soon. Bye.